Welcome to the Scientific Sense podcast, where we explore emerging ideas from science, policy, economics, and technology. My name is Gil Epen. We talk with world's leading academics and experts about their recent research or general areas of topical interest. Scientific Sense is an unstructured conversation with no agenda or preparation. We cover a wide variety of domains where new discoveries are made and new technologies are developed on a daily basis. We are most interested in how new ideas affect society and help educate the world how to pursue a rewarding and enjoyable life rooted in science, logic, and information. We seek knowledge without boundaries or constraints and provide unedited content of conversations with researchers and leaders who love what they do. A companion blog to this podcast can be found at scientificsense.com and this podcast is available on over a dozen platforms and directly at scientificsense.net. If you have suggestions for topics, guests, and other ideas, please send them to info at scientificsense.com and I can be reached at gil at epen.info. My guest today is Professor Giulio Passinetti. He's a professor of neurology, neuroscience, and geriatrics at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. He also serves as a director of basic, bio, basic and biomedical research in the Center for Geriatric Research and Training at the Bronze Veterans Affairs Medical Center. He is also the director of the Center for Molecular Integrative Neuroresilience at Mount Sinai. Welcome, Julio. Welcome. Thank you very much, Jill. Sure. Yeah. So your lab does a lot of work in Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease. Um, and one of your primary goal of the, of the lab is to investigate the biological processes which occur when during aging subjects with normal cognitive function convert into the very earliest stages of Alzheimer's uh, and then progressively to dementia. Um, you have determined that certain mechanisms may be at play early in the onset of AD, even before uh, overt signs of symptoms. You want to talk a bit about uh, what the lab lab is doing and what your focus is there? Uh, yes, thank you very much, Yala. I think I will, uh, um, I will uh, before answering your question, uh, I think it will be very good just to give a broader perspective. Yeah. Uh, of, from where we are coming from and, uh, and why we've been doing this work and, uh, and why also NIH and uh, NCCIH has been funding this program in the mechanism uh, we call neural resilience, but actually in promotion of resilience uh, and the promotion of the resilience is always have to be or something that we eventually we could delay mm. or we might eventually to prevent. Yeah. So the bottom line is that... Uh, um, the, uh, the program has been uh, developed in, uh, in, uh, with the support of uh, NIH, in particular the National Center for Complementary Integrative uh, Health, mm. as well as also the Office of uh, Dietary Supplement and the National Institute of Aging. And uh, uh, it's based primarily on one, just a very simple concept, that uh, in any disease, uh, we are very interested in neurodegeneration, but any kind of degenerative condition that is characterized to be progressive, uh, irreversible, and degenerative, um, is in some way something that uh, uh, research and science has been focused for two main kind of uh, potential application. Mm. One is basically to try to have a disease-modifying strategy, basically to block the disease. Mm. The other one, actually, something that is maybe symptomatic. Both of these two uh, appear to be, in some way, well, the symptomatic approach uh, for treating the sample, the treating the disease, uh, appears to be in some way uh, good, but in a very temporary manner because the disease actually progress is reversible and deteriorating. Mm. Uh, the other major alternative is actually to try to do disease modifying strategy, basically to block the curve mm. or to shift the curve in a way that actually will slow down the progression or maybe attenuate the disease. So, uh, so uh, the research projects um, in the botanical center, 
to understand mechanistically the potential role of certain uh, botanical dietary supplements, you say, in, yeah. in particular polyphenols. Uh, and the three different projects uh, going on uh, to promote resilience against uh, uh, psychological stress, that's project one, uh, sleep disorder-induced cognitive impairment, that is project two, uh, and then uh, clarifying the role of the microbiome, um, yeah. and that is project three. You want to talk a bit about all three of those things? Sure. So um, about uh, uh, five, three, four years ago, I participated into a what has been called the Lancet Commission for Prevention of Dementia. <laughs> uh, actually, initially, it was a Lancet Commission for Prevention and Treatment, and uh, then it became uh, um, uh, then became the Lancet Commission for uh, attenuation of the progression and prevention of the disease. So, in other words, uh, what this commission was able to uh, come up and actually was the result of this uh, kind of very fascinating kind of journey of understanding uh, where are we are coming from in terms of age and age-related disorder. We came up with this idea that about. Uh, 65% of uh, factors uh, are basically not preventable. Um, mm. And most of those are associated to genetic kind of predis predisposition. So, but there was something very extremely interesting. And, uh, and uh, actually we are witnessing now, uh, as I said before, some of these uh, study were actually demonstrated, for example, that with the diet, mind diet, you can attenuate the mechanism of Alzheimer's disease or onset of dementia, uh, this kind of uh, other 35 potential uh, uh, preventable factors mm. uh, are associated primarily, as I said, to diet, are associated, for example, to many, uh, to many factors, like, for example, well, we know that tra the traumatic brain injury, for example, is one of the major risk factors in onset of dementia. Mm. But it's also true that uh, we need also to keep in consideration that uh, uh, there are other kind of uh, social uh, aspects that uh, like loneliness, loneliness and uh, and depression is actually one of the most uh, most important things to actually to keep in uh, in mind. Anxiety, uh, all of these factors uh, that is uh, in some way um, uh, they were uh, still in part, uh, let's say, until a few years ago, in part disregarded as uh, just a in terms of causality. Mm -hmm. Because a very important thing is to be scientist is always to be sure that are able to discern what is a maybe as an observational condition that it may be in parallel versus something that have a causality. Because if you don't have a causality, there is no an effect, and there is not a causal effect relationship, and there is no way that you actually can interfere with that. So actually, in the last five years, three years, it became very clear that some kind of a mood disorder like anxiety depression major depression disorder ptsd some of these kind of uh, circumstances may play an important role into the mechanism of onset of a disease of uh, of, uh, of dementia a uh, stressful condition so actually what we decided is uh, in part uh, to initiate some studies and we did uh, like in uh, in a regular drug discovery screening uh the identification tried to characterize several type of uh, what we call polyphenol metabolites. Yeah. Like actually we have done a pharmacokinetic study. Basically, actually we develop a study like in animal model where we develop uh, a certain kind of uh, a dietary uh, polyphenolic preparation. Mm. And then through bioavailability study, we were able to identify, first of all, which are, which are the metabolites that can maybe just circulate in blood those were actually excluded through urine, or those were that actually are capable to reach the brain. Right. Typical same study that actually can be called phase one or phase one B that you can do with human beings. So basically, we mimic the same identical thing that actually we had done in, uh, you can do in human, but actually done in mice. Mm. So the bottom line is uh, that was a very important after this screening is that we identify a couple of potential molecules Actually, I can tell you uh, that there are different kind of a uh, very complex kind of metabolism. The metabolism of polyphenol is a very complex mechanism that uh, uh, imply uh, guts, but also imply even uh, liver as well as uh, many other different metabolic pathways. 
Uh, and uh, what we identify to not to make to make a long story short, we identify, for example, two metabolites. Uh, one is actually was called malvidin glucoside, mm-hmm. and uh, we, which uh, originally was uh, which originally actually was found uh, to cross the blood brain barrier and also to reach the brain. Um, and uh, and the other one that uh, indeed is called uh, like a small phenolic acid, which actually is derived yeah. from the polyphenol metabolism that is called free HDA, free hydroxycapaic acid, and which we decided to take as a potential Nobel generated potential new compound. And then just to say, well, if we treat the human, we have a polyphenolic preparation, but then we understand that we have a two, though this, uh, let's say, in tri- the, the, this kind of uh, 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 drugs that actually, we can call it drugs, but actually a natural compound that actually generated by your own body yes. after the digestion. And we use those to test in an animal model of stress. So there are several models of stress. Uh, in that particular study that actually we would discuss in that particular paper. So, so Julio, became... uh, you know, for my own understanding, so the, the diet of a human uh, then creates uh, some of these molecules uh, in the gut, and that's where the microbiome uh, is right. effective. And then uh, some of this, a couple of these molecules that you mentioned uh, have been able to essentially get through the blood brain barrier. So it can actually have an impact yes. on the brain. Uh, it is a very important anyway. And I apologize, maybe I took a little bit kind of more time, but it's very important to keep this in mind. That, uh, yes, when I was saying that that the original diet that you can, uh, well, it could be the diet, for example, polyphenolic preparation, could be fruit, can be actually vegetable, leaf vegetables, many other different things actually uh, um, that actually you can use in your own normal diet, but you need to identify which one are the biologically active compound mm. if you want to really to develop from there a pharmacological strategy. And um, you need a microbiome strategy too for it to work, right? That is correct. Yeah. But uh, you do not have to assume that all the metabolites that are actually generated through absorption in the gut yeah. that eventually are uh, mediated by the microbiome mm are actually generated and are going to generate anything that is maybe uh, potentially of, uh, of interest or maybe uh, bioactive uh, or bioactive or relevant to be investigated. Mm-hmm. So that is the reason you do first animal study because the animal study allow you to do the screening. Yeah. And then eventually you validate this kind of a uh, compound that are part of the microbiome as well. Mm-hmm. Actually, one of those from the microbiome. And then you're going to have in separate study, you're going to say, well, now I have uh, found that, that the body, our body is capable to generate uh, these two uh, very interesting molecules. If I'm going to treat an animal that is depressed or has anxiety, yes. I am able really to attenuate and then I'm going to avoid it to give them all those uh, foods and all the uh, uh, or uh, or. or or a, a huge amount of, uh, of uh, or actually prevent maybe some of the dietary recommendation, mm. uh, basically actually to generate a new uh, of uh, new generation of drugs, but actually natural compound generated by your own body. And uh, the answer is yes. Yes. And the microbiome play an important role. Yes. Yeah. So for my own understanding, Julio, again, so certain polyphenols um, ultimately the mechanistically. Uh, it could have an have a sort of a mediating effect on psychological stress, uh, which you say uh, ultimately has an impact on on Alzheimer's and dementia. Uh, and so, if I understand this correctly, what you are what you're arguing is that you can actually design a diet uh, that, along with you know, you could almost custom design a diet for a human in this in this way. It is indeed uh, the second part of uh, the extra, the new five years of the investigation. Yeah. 
Uh, and uh, the new five years investigation is actually after we identified that we can identify the molecules that we understand the microbiome, <laughs> that actually we have some of these molecules that can attenuate the cognitive de de deterioration in, uh, in model of Alzheimer's disease. And also in part that is uh, played by the microbiome. The next question is that, can we define a diet that we can give yes. uh, specifically for, for example, stress-related mechanisms right. that we know are a major risk factor. And by the way, uh, depression and uh, loneliness and uh, anxiety is one of the top, uh, I would say that there's basically probably one of the top uh, risk factors with diabetes and metabolic syndrome mm. and the acceleration of, uh, of the disease. Right. So, uh, yes, we have uh, this actually, we passed to the next level of our investigation. We are going to try to treat subject at increasing concentration. And I will tell you then uh, later on, on uh, about, about uh, what are the, this compound. Uh, with increasing concentration of uh, this uh, polyphenolic preparation, that are actually dietary polyphenolic preparation, mm -hmm. all of it is based on the idea that our preclinical study suggested that they are once given to mouse or possibly even in human, they generate bioactive compound, basically uh, effective drugs. Um, we are going to give uh, uh, to human an increasing concentration, increasing amount uh, across the time. And then it's try to see, and then it's try to expose a uh, subject uh, that went through this kind of uh, regimen uh, of treatments, and there will be, and then will, of course, will be in blind, and also in uh, groups also will receive uh, the real compound, and the other one actually will receive the placebo. Mm -hmm. And then expose all of them uh, to a, what is called the trier test, the stress trier test. So in some way, um, something that uh, maybe, I don't know, many people that uh, maybe are out of where, uh, or maybe now will ask a question, how, what do you do as a stress to a human that is ethically acceptable? So actually so, the stress- so, that, uh, yeah. Quick question. So these trials, these are subjects, they not they don't have a diagnosis of Alzheimer's or any new neurodegenerative diseases, right? No. Absolutely not. Okay, so and this is the fundamental part of our study. Yeah. Because uh, before, and I remember that this is the way our NIH now recommend of how to pursue clinical trial. But how will avoid. the how will the endpoint be in this trial? Um, okay. Well, guys, what if his hypothesis is correct? Is that we are going to see that two things that basically the subject that they receive the treatment for five weeks, uh, exposed to a trier, theta, trier test, that is basically nothing else, that actually to be able to give a presentation uh, that was unexpected in front of an audience that is one of the major stressful conditions in human beings, as, uh, as you might like, uh, or actually, so, if, you, if you ever heard that before. And if indeed that is the case, we should be able to see that... Uh, well, the uh, that our treatment arm had some kind of function in terms of attenuation, the stressful responses, attenuation of a cytokine or actually inflammatory responses, but actually the placebo will actually will be uh, stressed and actually there will be an incremental amount of inflammatory responses that are always associated with the stress that actually we are going to provoke. Okay, so the, the goal here is the active arm um, will be more able to deal with stress compared to the placebo arm? Is that the measurement? That's correct. And um, that measurement, uh, granted, it, it, it sort of confirms the, the mouse model uh, observations, but it doesn't necessarily go into, um, you know, ultimately the beneficial effects that you hypothesize on the Alzheimer's arena, right? Well, I mean, the, the bottom line is you have to think about uh, that uh, you need, uh, um, that are, uh, we are talking about, uh, just for these studies, we are talking about uh, uh, millions and millions of dollars of investigation. Now, um, remember that uh, uh, 
the uh, one of the most prescribed drugs in a, in Alzheimer's disease are basically anti, anti, antidepressant agent, anti-anxiety agent. Um, and uh, uh, to answer your question, uh, the design, and also as it was designed, uh, you probably um, carefully read what was the original uh, funding of the grants that actually for which I provided you information. Mm. The goal was not to study Alzheimer's disease. That is something that actually was uh, even five years before for the study that we had done in 2010 and 2000, uh, actually 2010, 2015. Uh, in 2015, uh, in the 2005, 2010, sorry. That is actually was a little bit kind of different story, uh, but the uh, center grant that we have funded right now as a, a fundamental part to try to understand if we can attenuate immune inflammatory responses in the central nervous system. Now, if we want to get into a little bit more detail about how innate immunity in response to stress uh, may promote some kind of Alzheimer's disease, mm. well, in a, that will require immediately some other kind of uh, uh, investigation in human. Now, we have done several studies even to uh, imply, actually to understand the mechanism of, uh, of these inflammatory responses that now we can call inflammasome, that is basically nothing else that uh, part of our innate immunity, which is in the brain, is uh, localized in specific inflammatory cells. Mm -hmm. Now, we discovered and we reported that uh, this mechanism of innate immunity in a experimental model of Alzheimer's disease may play an important role in promoting subtle but chronic and eventually long-standing inflammatory responses that may be responsible for a further acceleration of degenerative condition. Okay. Uh, did we prove that? Yes, we did prove the in animal model of the disease. And uh, we know that uh, Alzheimer's disease and uh, stress, most likely they a uh, certain kind of a, a certain stage of, uh, of the disease are actually remembered as the certain stage of age because age is one of the major risk factors in Alzheimer's disease. They, may, they might eventually meet an, uh, at some crossroad and uh, we'll start uh, asking each other, um, we will start asking each other can we attenuate this kind of a degenerative inflammatory responses to attenuate the progression of the cognitive deterioration that eventually will lead to some kind of a degenerative condition, irreversible and, uh, and progressive? Well, the answer in preclinical model is yes. Okay. But so first. Uh, okay, so let, let me touch on a couple of other things. Uh, one of the other sure. projects is uh, sleep disorder-induced cognitive impairment. Uh -huh. uh, is that something that's ongoing, or what? What are the findings there? Okay, uh, that is a that is a is a completely it's a completely different ball game, but it's always in some way an extremely interesting kind of factor. Um, when uh, the grant was uh, designed to identify stress-related condition associated to some mechanism that can accelerate age-related degenerative condition, well, in this particular case, could be Parkinson's disease, could be Alzheimer's disease. We actually can entertain all our research in Parkinson as well as, and as well as form of Parkinsonism and mechanism of proteostasis where polyphenol metabolites may actually may attenuate some of this pathology, which is actually beyond the scope of this discussion. Uh, uh, the idea was always to identify some stressful condition. Now, sleep deprivation and acute sleep deprivation, as well as also acute or actually chronic sleep deprivation, but our work on acute sleep deprivation actually led us to really to understand something extremely phenomenal, that uh, uh, even just a six hour of acute sleep deprivation, um, actually a few hours, but then we can chronic, but I, even a couple hours of sleep deprivation because I have to done, uh, because I, uh, it's done at different time of the day, yeah. just to, uh, because of the, uh, because of rodents, uh, actually was uh, sufficient enough 
to uh, then once tested in a, in a behavioral testing for cognitive uh, learning uh, with, for example, with, uh, with uh, the classical uh, what is motor, what is uh, modest water testing. Uh, we, we, we identified that actually even a short period of time of uh, sleep deprivation actually will lead to cognitive impairment. Mm. And we were very interested to try to understand some of the mechanisms through which this polyphenol, uh, again, all we're starting from this bioavailability of, uh, of the studies that uh, we are done in, in, uh, in mice, um, uh, and try to see if uh, there was some kind of mechanism that we could actually attenuate or for actually, first of all, to reverse the behavior. Indeed, it is something that actually we were able uh, to, in, uh, to try to, to identify. Mm -hmm. And uh, once we used uh, the uh, a technology, actually the wider uh, RNA sequencing technique, from animal that were sleep deprived versus an animal that actually were uh, actually we call placebo in the sense that uh, animal that uh, were not actually were left in the cage. Basically, the control group of mice. Mm. Interestingly, what we found that uh, as the same level of uh, how you're gonna eventually have a stressful condition that uh, theoretically is now considered to be all of these are related to some kind of associated to some kind of inflammation is exactly what we found in the brain of a sleep deprived animal. And the interesting part that are now recollect with Alzheimer's disease is that we found that the same molecule, mm -hmm. like the called the innate immunity in the brain, were actually activated and then uh, were associated. And this is actually a paper that is uh, now currently being reviewed. Uh, 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 were associated to certain kind of uh, regulation of uh, circadian rhythm genes mm -hmm. that uh, in some way uh, were able to control the daylight, uh, daylight and sleep uh, and day, day night uh, shift of certain kind of uh, metabolic pathways, hormonal pathways, and was completely disrupted on in that particular case. Mm. So the bottom line, we associated the inflammation to some of these kind of uh, cascades of events. Mm. And uh, one thing that's very important to keep in mind, the message from, again, that is unified to all the discussion that we had, uh, with, that we have just had just uh, in the last uh, few, uh, few uh, minutes, that is uh, that in some way, if you have, uh, if you have, uh, if you have, for example, jet lag kind of stress, cognitive impairment, mm. all of us experience this kind of a condition, uh, or a, or a people for a shift, the work and night uh, for uh, people working in shift uh, and uh, have uh, some kind of sleep deprivation. Mm. All of these kind of things uh, have been very well reported, including disease like a sleep apnea. That is one of the most important things and disease that right now uh, is uh, widely investigated. And we had done all, all already some kind of investigation in part in the human. What we found is that uh, are associated to the activation of the kind of innate immunity inflammasome cascade mm. that actually we found in the later stages, middle earlier, uh, we can call prodromal stages of, uh, of uh, people, uh, of subject that they develop a very early stage of my cognitive impairment in, uh, in brain of Alzheimer's disease. Mm. So now, is the, uh, are we talking about two completely different things? Well, it may be possible. Uh, are all the Alzheimer's disease associated to sleep deprivation? Well, you know, sleep deprivation is one of the major problems in, uh, in subject, primarily with later stage of Alzheimer's, not even in my cognitive impairment, but that there are even subjects in prodromal, even in preclinical stages. Prodromal is basically somebody that is asymptomatic, asymptomatic but still I have some neuropathology in the brain. Preclinical is basically somebody that doesn't have anything that actually is supposed to be at risk because uh, age is the only major risk to develop Alzheimer's disease. So, uh, I, yeah. go ahead. Um, so, let, let's close with touching on another one, um, which is, um, your lab is also focused on building a model based on genetic and environmental information to predict cognitive decline mm -hmm. in overweight and obese individuals uh, with type 2 diabetes. You want to talk a bit about that? This is called the look ahead. 
study. Um, and so would it be correct in saying that there is a correlation between overweight and obese individuals with type 2 diabetes and cognitive decline, uh, number one. And number two, uh, people who are overweight and obese individuals may be pre-diabetic or, or may be diabetic uh, through lifestyle changes uh, could potentially uh, slow down um, the, the issue that might happen in that cognitive decline arena. Both of those statements are true? My, my recommendation is yes, yes, yes. As soon as you reach middle age, uh, but this is something that uh, we should start into education, young, uh, uh, young people, even the, in the thirties and the forties, we can start doing prevention of Alzheimer's disease in the, at the age of 30. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, one of the fundamental parts, as you said, is, uh, yes, uh, can we reduce obesity and attenuate diabetes? and eventually to reduce the incidence or incidence or the prevalence, uh, depending upon what kind of population you're going to look, and, um, um, and then reduce uh, the onset of a uh, degenerative condition in the brain? The answer is yes. Yeah. Any physician should recommend to anybody past the age of 40 to have a reasonable understanding of what is... Uh, the destiny that they are creating for themselves, mm -hmm. uh, primarily just uh, for something. Remember uh, something that, uh, that is related to our nutrition. Yeah. Remember that the ones that you're gonna look to yourself uh, on uh, on the mirror, <laughs> and then you're gonna see your uh, your uh, you're gonna see you're gonna see yourself. You're gonna just say, "This is uh, your brain." on food. <laughs> that's right. And I conclude that. Yeah, yeah. That's excellent. That's excellent. Yeah, thanks so much, Julio, for spending time with me today. And uh, good luck with all this important research that you're doing. Fantastic, Julio. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Bye. Take care.